there are a lot of questions which we need to answer before investing in any particular stock be it what exactly is the company doing what is the business model what are some of the competitive moats whether the company would be sustainable how is the promoter of the company what are some of the names of the independent directors in the industry and all the questions answers once we get them then we decide whether to invest in the company or not in this video it gives me an immense pleasure to tell you that i have interviewed saurav mukherjee rakshit ranjan and salil desai from marshless investment managers where we have spoken about the power of long term compounding the power of investing and most importantly how to identify if the promoters of the company are stealing money or not but the bigger question is how do we get all this data so i have something very good for you there's an application called ticker tape which is a fintech company where you can access the financials of the company you can get to know about the stock of that company you simply have to type the name of the stock and you get all the details be the p ratio price to book ratio their investor presentations their annual reports everything in fact the latest coverage or the latest news of that company are also covered in ticker tape and most importantly it also shows the percentage of analysts who are giving buy recommendation and sell recommendation on that stock so if you go at the financial section you can get to know about the income statement and balance sheet which is given in a very simple format and you can easily identify what is the profitability what is the revenue what are the operating margins of this company so that you can decide whether to invest in the company or not so get set for this amazing podcast where we have discussed everything about the power of long term investing so here you go Hello everyone welcome to the series named conversation with kushal today once again we have mr saurav mukherjee with us along with two of his colleagues salil desai and rakshit ranjan three of the smartest minds and smartest finance professionals of our country from marcellus investment managers so let me just take a minute and quickly introduce the three of them so saurav is the founder and chief investment officer at marcellus investment managers and author of four best selling books including coffee can investing and the unusual billionaire He's an alum of London School of Economics, and he was the CEO of Ambit Capital. Rakshit Ranjan manages Marcellus flagship consistent compounders fund, and he is a B Tech from IIT Delhi and a CFA charter holder. He has a total experience of 16 years in equity investing in UK and India, and he is also a co-author of Coffee Can Investing with Mr. Saurav Mukherjee. Salil Desai is a chartered accountant and an MBA. So coming from the same fraternity, I feel proud that Salil is also there on the show. and uh, he spent over 16 years covering diverse sectors in indian equity markets including india's largest family investment offices he manages large advisory portfolios at marcellus so thank you so much gentlemen for coming up and taking out your time to guide the entire audience and thank you so much for accepting the invitation to come here pleasure being here thank you for inviting us kushal no problem at all so sort of we'll be discussing mostly on the power of long term compounding the power of long term investments and you know the four myths as you also mentioned in your new book diamonds in the dust mm-hmm. which i have read it with utmost interest so i have it with me in fact and i'll highly recommend everyone to Thank read you. this book diamonds in the dust because it talks about how the promoters are stealing money and it also lays down the forensic accounting ratios which all the finance professionals understand and basis which we can identify whether the promoter of this company is stealing money or not so first things first like uh, i read in your book and you have given a wonderful metaphor in terms of uh, investing comparing it with test cricket and rahul dravid so you also mentioned that investing is more like a test cricket where you have to leave aside the risky balls outside the off stump and you have to score your uh, ones or twos regularly and then you have to just dispatch the occasional loose balls to the boundary so similarly even in investing you have to leave aside the risky stocks but what happens nowadays is that the people like me who are the retail individuals who don't get a chance to talk to the management directly we can't read the minds of the management so let's take an example companies like satyam who are at par with wipro tcs and uh, infosys in the year 2003 to 2004 and 5 we can't read the minds of the management and investors lose a lot of wealth in this particular case where the fraud is revealed after the fraud has been committed so in trading like what uh, the argument of traders is that they tell that there's a stop loss concept in trading so even if this fraud is happened the stop loss gets triggered and the loss is minimized so what would be your argument to say that investing is again a better option or better opportunity as compared to trading so look uh, i think kushal i think that the, the the way we can use the cricket analogy further is uh, a lot of people in our country end up sort of seeing investing as t20 cricket right they think that har ball ko chhakka chauka marenge right and and, and and that impression is exacerbated by by high frequency news non stop tv coverage of the market uh, uh, social media and so on that the sense that money is being made every minute uh, by buying and selling stocks right uh, um, what what life has taught us what our training has taught us is investing is more like test cricket 
um, uh, uh, test cricket as we know because it's a, it's a rare sport played over five days. Uh, patience and the ability to bide your time, the ability to select the right balls is critical for success, right? But there's another way in which we can think of investing as test cricket, right? So, so if you think of test cricket, right, just to become a test cricketer, the amount of preparation required is is immense, right? You can't just suddenly, you know, at the age of 16, say, my school say test cricket khelunga. You typically play Ranji cricket for a good six, seven, eight years. Then you get to play a few one-day internationals for India, and then you graduate to the test team. Uh, even the best cricketers, Rahul Dravid included, started playing for India around 23, 24 years of age, right? Investing is a lot like that. There's years of preparation. People like Saril, people like yourself, the Chartered Accountancy Qualification, you guys have done the CFA Charter that Rakshit has done. That's three, four years of solid work just to get the basic qualification, a CA or a CFA, to get going. Even after you've got that basic qualification, there's a almost a decade-long apprenticeship working for people like Salil and Rakshit. You are an apprentice to them. They teach you how to, to read annual reports, how to uh, uh, question management teams, how to collect primary data from distributors, dealers, suppliers. And then if you've made good progress through your CA, CFA days in your apprenticeship under people like Salil Rakshit, then around the age of 30, you actually graduate to becoming an investor and very similar process to becoming a test cricketer. There's a, there's a long period of training. Once you are trained, once you are trained, the key skill is to realize as in test cricket, that most balls can be left alone or played defensively. Now let's look at that analogy in the stock market context. There are 6,000 stocks listed in India. In the last 10 years, 16 companies have delivered 80% of the wealth created in the Indian market. Right, 16 out of 6,000, right? If you see a typical Marcellus portfolio, either in Diamonds in the Dust or in our uh, book, Unusual Billionaires, a typical portfolio will have 15 stocks. 6,000 stocks in the country, 15 stocks in the portfolio, 15, 16 stocks pretty much make all the wealth in the stock market. Similarly, if you look at corporate profits, barely a dozen companies today make 90% of India's profits, right? So very similar to test cricket, investing is very similar to test cricket in the amount of preparation required to get to play at that highest level. And then at the highest level, being extremely judicious in leaving balls, in playing strokes. And that is the hallmark of a great player. We've used Rahul Dravid and Diamonds in the Dust as an analogy. And in a way, Salil Rakshit are the Rahul Dravids of the investing world. Right, get it. The problem I see with all the young investors, especially the millennials who have come in this uh, investing phase as of now because of all these uh, disruptive tech brokerages like Zero, the Upstocks, Angel Broking, because of them, a large number of retail participation has also increased. Problem with them is that everyone wants quick money. So what would be your advice to all those investors or retail individuals who are just looking for short term money and they don't have the patience to wait for 10, 15 years to make their money compounded? I think Salil, Salil worked on the opening chapter of um, Diamonds in the Dust, where this issue has been explained in detail. I would request Salil to give his thoughts on this issue of how do you help, how can an investor build patience? What are the incentives for the investor to build patience? Sure. Salil? Uh, yeah, sort of. Uh, so Kushal, you know, this is this is a very common uh, uh, feedback that you get from a lot of people, right? Young people uh, uh, in the middle of uh, markets that are pretty buoyant. Uh, uh, you think you buy something, it, uh, the stock goes up and, and then you have the necessary skill to really uh, keep repeating that. Right? The risk here is that this is not necessarily a repeatable uh, outcome. Right? Every stock that you touch is not going to really turn into gold, so to say. Uh, uh, what, what investors need to do, and we have sh shown that with a lot of data uh, in the book, is that if you invest regularly in good quality companies, right? Uh, and you hold to it patiently, right? You will end up making better returns than most of these other uh, uh, strategies that, like you said, because it goes back to the fact that you can't uh, you you can't make it repeatable. It's not possible that every day or every month you'll find a stock which is going to go up five, ten, fifteen, twenty percent, right? Uh, so it's a very clearly established fact with data that. You invest regularly and hold patiently. Now, how do you do this? Right, that's the biggest problem. Uh, like right. you were saying, that uh, uh, how do you build this patience? Uh, so there are two ways. One is uh, you make a mistake and you learn from that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, that's uh, there's a price to that. Right, you you're losing uh, capital, and a lot of young people end up uh, uh, end up losing money that way. Uh, the second is that you know you you look at 
the data, read the book, right, and figure out for yourself whether you want to invest and then uh, have a good night's sleep rather than figuring out what is going to happen to the stock price tomorrow, day after, you know, after a month, a week, uh, and so on. Because uh, again, we've shown this with with numbers, with data, is that timing or figuring out what's going to happen in a short span of time is practically impossible, right? What what you can only bank on is that. You, in which the company which has healthy earnings, uh, potential competitive advantages and clean accounts. Right? So these three all will eventually lead to a stock price appreciation over the long period of time. Uh, you can't time the market. You can't, even if you get lucky once, twice, you can't do it uh, on a recurring basis. Uh, so right. rather than wasting your time in or time and effort in doing all of that, uh, you rather waste, uh, spend your time in, uh, in figuring out which are the great companies to invest in. And just stay invested for the long term. Right. In fact, even in your book, I've read that like uh, you've also stated if a person has buy- is buying a stock on 52 week low every year and versus a person who's buying it on 1st January every year, irrespective of the time, only like there's a marginal difference of one percentage or maybe half a percentage exactly. in the returns of the person who's buying the stock on 52 week low versus the person who's bought on 1st January. Right. In fact, uh, Kushal, for some of these stocks, if you buy even them, uh, buy them even at a 52 week high every year, right, mm-hmm. your returns are still 20% plus. Uh, okay. So, so forget okay. trading, forget timing, focus on investing in companies which have the three qualities, clean accounts, competitive advantages and great capital allocation skills. Correct. Wonderful. So, you know, like since Marcellus also has so much of uh, so many blogs, I've also read your blogs on your website and you've also like laid out so many things through your books, all the books which have uh, authored Saurabh, Brakshit and Salil. And uh, there are also many YouTube videos where you have like uh, told everyone about this power of investing with the statistics, with the data, which is backed. Whenever you say something, of course, there's a lot of data and there's a lot of work which goes behind that. Why aren't people still gaining money in the stock markets or maybe what is it happening or what is it going wrong with us that we are not able to earn money? Because since there's a lot of knowledge available and you have laid out clearly in your books that if you invest for 20 years or 10 years, then you'll easily be able to gain like 20% 20% Kager on Asian Paints or maybe on PD Light and any other return. So what's going wrong in this? Even if we have so much knowledge going around, like this is free content, which is revolving everywhere. So what is it that's going wrong according to you? So I think uh, you know, the, the way we, we, we have described investing in our blogs, in our webinars, in our newsletters and in Diamonds in the Dust, right? And by the way, all the material is available free of charge on Marcellus.in. Um, uh, the way we have described it is investing is simple. The basic precepts of investing, clean account, a high quality capital allocation by the promoter, strong comparative advantages. Investing is simple, but simple is not easy, right? And I think Rakshit uh, has helped us all understand why simple isn't easy. And in a way for everybody watching today, if you guys can uh, uh, take take on board uh, Rakshit's message on why simple isn't easy, I think that's 90% of investing solved for you. So Rakshit, do you want to just give people an insight why simple isn't easy? Sure. So simple isn't easy, I would say for uh, two broad reasons. One, simple is boring, right? Uh, complex is exciting, right? And we always want to do exciting stuff, uh, Uh, Our psychology many a time pushes us to do more of exciting stuff than boring stuff, right? Uh, That's that's one reason. And and again, you can relate to the test cricket example. Uh, 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 Many youngsters, when they start watching cricket, they prefer T20 over test, uh, even when they're watching. When they start playing test cricket, again, uh, uh, T20 success, uh, many people try their hands on that uh, far more frequently than uh, test success because test success is actually harder, but it's also boring, although it is simple, right? Uh, so that's that's one reason. The second reason, uh, as Saurabh mentioned, you need the training. You need the training. Rahul Dravid has uh, gone through uh, several thousands of hours of training in order to become what he has become. Um, uh, that training cannot be uh, ignored. What people believe is uh, that uh, that by watching Rahul Dravid on TV, they can learn uh, learn the strokes and they can also uh, stand on the cricket pitch and uh, and and hit a few balls. Uh, but that's uh, that's not uh, cricket. That's uh, that's just maybe having a punt. Uh, similarly, in investing, just because uh, somebody told you the list of stocks that you should have bought, uh, if you just go ahead and buy those stocks, that's not investing actually. I mean, that's just uh, that's just replicating at a point in time. 
but uh, as the time progresses uh, you won't be able to do justice on many fronts so uh, so that's uh, that's the reason why one if you don't train yourself if you don't uh, don't learn how to uh, how to exclude the stocks that you shouldn't be touching if you don't learn how to pick up stocks with high pricing power and high competitive advantages just because somebody gave you the the list of names uh, will not help you make money neither will you be able to allocate enough uh, to to such a replicated portfolio nor will you be able to do justice to the discipline required to nurture and evolve that portfolio on an ongoing basis and hence investing won't be productive a very simple analogy that you can actually take uh, uh, from the investing world is uh, um um i i think uh, that there uh, probably more than 40 50 books if not more than 100 books written on warren buffett right uh, warren buffett's newsletters are read by thousands of people every year um everybody knows what warren buffett has bought and he very very nicely also explains in his newsletters uh, why he's bought what he's bought right but uh, still nobody has been able to replicate the kind of compounding the kind of rate of return that he has uh, 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 generated for uh, for his firm right so so to that extent uh, just by knowing the list of stocks is not going to help you and if you put your hard earned money behind a list in a replica um i mean that's uh, that's that's quite damaging what we are trying to do by giving uh, giving out our approach our list of stocks etc is we are trying to educate people to at least understand the the problems so that uh, they 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 make a move to find a solution to those problems either by finding a right wealth manager or finding a right wealth, uh, fund manager or if they want to do it themselves then at least knowing the path that they have to walk on this training journey so so yeah right. so it's not Yeah. Get it. Do you think that it boils down to the same problem which we discussed earlier that people aren't like quite patient enough to have that attitude of holding a stock for 10 to 15 years? What happens nowadays is that if you're talking to a friend, most of the people would tell about their gains. कि यार ये stock में इतना पैसा मिला है, ये stock में मैंने इतना return कमाया percentage terms में. But nobody is willing to talk about their losses, and it's like people would be very reluctant to share. Okay, यार इसमें इतना loss हो गया मेरा. So this is also one of the advantages that lot of these retail individuals they get into this short term money of investing and then they are inclined to you know sell the stock after 3 to 6 months even after getting a 50% return if the stock has given that amount of return so do you think it boils down to the same problem of having patience yes uh, it is it is the same problem of having patience uh, but not just patience uh, investing in the right portfolio before you even think about the patience right um, and uh, i mean these concepts in in one of your questions you asked about stop loss uh, these are uh, these are all examples of uh, not having done your homework well enough uh, right i mean uh, uh, you would do a stop loss in a casino right uh, why would you do a stop loss in a in a well thought through investment portfolio in fact in a well thought through investment portfolio if a bajaj finance falls in the month of march or april 2020 you would buy more of it rather than saying that stop loss will trigger an exit from bajaj finance because it has fallen by 60% you would buy more of it in hindsight uh, there will always be out of 100 people maybe five people who really did buy uh, and and you hear those in your lift uh, lift uh, journeys in your right. residential complexes and in your social gatherings that somebody bought bajaj finance in in april and hence you believe that it's easy but that's that's where i think what sort of was saying simple isn't easy right. patience is needed but before that you also need to figure out a way to pick up the right uh, right portfolio and do the right actions during the patient time right i think kushal and another simple way to think about it is like uh, if you look at test cricket everybody knows how successful rahul dravid has been the numbers are easy to look up a right? test average of 54 the, the highest scoring number 3 batsman uh, in the history of the game the bat, the batsman who's played the most deliveries in the history of the game the mass batsman who's participated in the most partnerships in test cricket right the batsman who has won the most number of test matches for india abroad etc etc sabko pata hai yet in the decade roughly a decade since rahul dravid's exit from international cricket we only had one batsman of that caliber in this vast nation of ours there's only cheteshwar pujara who can broadly measure up to dravidian standard right everybody knows what dravid does what dravid does is simple but what dravid does is so hard that in 10 years one batsman has been able to do it right get get i guess completely agree with you on that point as well and in fact in one of your uh, youtube interviews re- recently you also gave an interview with edge community and i was also referring to that that you had mentioned that you can analyze 
that whether the promoter is stealing money or not just by reading the past few years annual reports of that company so annual reports are publicly available of all the listed entities on the public domain so how do you prioritize while reading the annual reports and what sections do you feel are one of the like most important where we should focus on so that even we can understand whether the promoter is stealing money or not so look i mean uh, uh, this is why we in marcelus are heavily long on the indian chartered accountancy profession uh, thanks to uh, uh, seasoned chartered accountants like salil we've been fortunate to build a team of uh, uh, 13 cas in marcelus i think we can pro- say very proudly some of india's far- finest chartered accountants work in our team and 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 you know people like rakshit and myself who are cfas we are not cas we have learned from our ca colleagues how to read annual reports how to spot the chori of uh, naughty promoters so there's a bunch of ratios that we use uh, ratios that have been developed over a, more than a longer than a 10 year period now by our colleagues so chapters 2 and 3 of the book uh, delve into this subject about forensic accounting i'll request salil to uh, give give uh, the, view, the the people watching this so some insight into how in chapters 2 and 3 of diamonds in the dust we have given uh, insights as to how the marcelus forensic team actually works salil uh so kushal uh, uh, you know there are three different or the three uh, three steps or three levels of checks that you can do right now these are in detail so <clears throat> uh, i'll explain that and then i'll tell you what beginners could uh, select and pick and choose from these so the first level checks is a set of accounting ratios there are about 12 in all uh you know they would range from something as simple as Uh, how much of operating profit is getting converted to say operating cash flow right? because uh, uh, finally cash is is what what we are interested in cash is uh, like i said cash is real and profit is an opinion uh, uh, another simple ratio could be you know, how much are auditors getting paid uh, is there a growth in auditors remuneration which is faster than the growth in revenues right the scope of work is not increasing why is the fee increasing uh so you you uh, uh, look at a set of these 12 ratios to figure out what is the quality gradient of the companies right are they in the uh, are they in the top quartile in the bottom decile and so on it just gives you a sense of how the quality is the second level is to actually go and do governance checks governance checks would include you know how good is the board quality uh, you know how is decision making within the company uh, how are related party transactions uh, and a set of uh, checks around this Uh, and the third level checks are actually you go and you know, speak to let's say uh, the company's suppliers right or uh, customers try right? to you figure out ethical standards you figure out the way of doing business you might want to talk to say former employees uh, uh, and get a sense of how the company uh, works now these three are kind of detailed uh, checks that you do to be confident that something wrong is not happening now as a beginner like you rightly said it is not possible that they can actually uh, do all of this uh, what as a beginner as somebody who does not understand say too much of accounting what you could do is actually focus on just three or four things uh, the first thing is you uh, look at the cash flow statement this is a pretty simple standard uh, disclosure in in the annual report you check whether cash flow from operations right? there's no calculation required you see whether the cash flow from operations say over the last 3 4 years has been higher than the operating profit or not uh definitely it has to be positive right there is there is no two way about uh, two ways about it uh, at the same time you check whether this cash flow is enough to pay for growth in the sense that there is something called as cash flow from investing which means that how much the company putting into uh, say capacity expansion uh, market expansion and so on if this is a positive number consistently then that is a good sign that right? you can move on to the uh, next the next is to check the quality of the board of directors again the disclosure is very clearly laid out uh, are these people who have something positive to contribute to the business do they bring bring diverse skills to to the board right say accounting strategy uh, governance uh, industry experience and so on uh, if the board is filled with friends relatives of of the of the promoters then that is something which you should uh, worry about uh, the third thing that you should check is uh, are the related party transaction uh, uh, disclosures again very clearly laid out you figure out who are they dealing with on the recurring basis are uh, is the promoter owned company a separately promoter owned company supplying say raw materials to, to to the listed company or the listed company selling most of its uh, finished goods through the promoter entity again not a great uh, not a great sign are is rent being paid in you know, excessive rents being paid to uh, families of the 
promoter or promoter control entities so these three are checks which are simple to do which mm-hmm. tell you if there is uh, something which you should worry about and whether it is worth your time to go and dig deeper into the yes. of course if you have time right. then it would be great to do some of the more detailed work also right and i think once you start reading the annual reports it's only the first time it's going to take a lot of time but once you get exactly. the format and once you get like what exactly is the content of that report the next annual reports it will be easier for the individual to read it in a much quicker way absolutely so we recommend at least 3 years uh, i think uh, that should largely do the do the trick for you right and even in the annual report there's a section of management discussion and analysis right so that talks about the sector attractiveness how attractive is the right. sector and then it talks about the companies policies and company strategies which have evolved over the past few years or what strategies they have worked in that current year so how important according to you is that management discussion and analysis sector because you focus on the fundamentals of the company as you said and sector attractiveness is a thing which is mentioned in mdna of the annual report so what weight is would you give to that mdna section while analyzing any company Uh, so the mdna is also you know the, the annual report we end to tend to end up reading cover to cover practically and the mdna is important because it tells you number one like you said that you know uh, uh, where are companies positioned in its market and what are the strategies to actually go and uh, say uh, achieve leadership or dominance in that market what are the strategies and then you need to analyze those strategies whether they will uh, work or or not uh but a lot of it is qualitative so the problem with the mdna is that how do you translate what is being said into something which can actually turn into a uh, uh, say very simply an roc which will be significantly about the cost of capital or at least much better than your peers uh so for this again you know if you read a few years of annual reports uh, you'll figure out how the thinking of the management is changing is there consistency in the strategy are they flexible enough to uh, notice how the environment is changing and you know uh, uh, change the strategies accordingly uh, effectively how they are responding to to the changing times uh, and if you find that there is something uh, missing here then that is against a red flag for you uh, okay. our belief is that just simply reading a few years of annual reports will actually give you or let tell you more about the business than than reading uh, just about anything uh, else Uh, right. whether it is in accounting cleanliness whether it is in strategy and approach uh, or it is purely of numbers right. so yeah reading that right. is a great thing so since you talked about that qualitative part and even the financial metrics like roc and the profitability so sort of my next question would be to you now even like uh, you have you had uh, mr r gopala krishnan on your marshless webinar i watched mm-hmm. that also and i was also fortunate enough to invite him for my episode and i also discussed about the framework which he uses building your uh, businesses into institutions so he focuses more on the mba framework which you also know the mindset behavior and action where he has laid down nine critical things which he evaluates while evaluating any management and these are like critical thinking people orientation etc so he is like he focuses more on the qualitative aspects and he is like the financial metrics mm-hmm. they are good for the looks of that company so what what are your views on this and what weightage would you give to the qualitative factors like the mba framework versus the financial metrics like we use the rocs profitability growth revenue growth etc so look i think uh, uh, gopala krishnan ji's framework is is uh, very good his books are uh, very interesting so i've read his books on i read his book on kotak uh, kotak yeah. indra bank and how the how the kotak built it uh, harsh mari wala built mariko and you know in- incredibly insightful man uh, we are professional investors we are managing monies for 8000 families That's many in many cases it's their life savings right and it's, uh, now it's close to 1 and 1/2 billion dollars right so we have to be extremely objective and how we do it so whatever we do we can't afford to indulge ourselves and say you know promoter pasand aaya culture pasand aayi humko acha laga right that of that sort of sentiment cannot be allowed to creep into our our style of investing so what we have done and is is build a framework uh, and a, a fair bit of it is described in diamonds in the dust we have built a framework which allows our our 14 analysts to look at every single stock objectively and score the company right we turn the qualitative characteristics of a company into a score the score drives our our position sizing our investing behavior right this this qualitative framework or this the framework which drives uh, these scores has has three pillars to it i request rakshit to to lay out the the marcellus framework for assessing companies and turning qualitative characteristics into a quant score which drives position sizing Sure. Sure. So, so the three pillars that Saurabh is uh, highlighting, uh, 
are uh, first of all at the ground level we want to assess uh, decentralization of execution which means uh, uh, rather than uh, uh, ad hoc ways of a uh, let's say a sales function or a marketing function or a raw material procurement function rather than ad hoc ways of working where uh, if an individual does a great job uh, the business works well if another individual in the same role same geography doesn't do a great job then the then the business doesn't get executed as well rather than having that sort of a dependence if it if it can be decentralized through systems and processes so we 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 want to understand uh, to what extent is it a systematic way of executing every function at the ground level and hence uh, uh, scale can be managed in a uniform way learnings can be uh, sort of integrated into those systems and processes to make them stronger deliver better on an ongoing basis uh, uh, in an institutionalized manner so that's one level then the next level above that is the c suite or the cxo layer the chief executive chief finance officer chief marketing chief sales etc in that uh, cxo layer we want to see appointment of candidates uh, into the cxo positions uh after having gone through several years of training uh, uh after having gone through uh, uh say 5 7 10 years of having been identified as one of the possible candidates for succession to the existing cxos and then being groomed into those roles uh in 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 various uh, ways and this again has to be a process this cannot be an ad hoc Uh, a, a replacement of an existing CXO with the next CXO when the need arose, right? It can't be that uh, one fine day existing CXO retired or resigned or unfortunately, let's say maybe in some cases passed away, and then suddenly uh, uh, the everybody is scrambling around to find the replacement. It has to be a process. Uh, so that's the CXO layer: high quality and process oriented succession. and then right at the top the board of directors should be independent they should be part of a culture on the board which allows uh, active participants uh, active participation of independent directors in the decision making on the strategic fronts for the organization it should not be that the promoter just because he's the largest shareholder he is dictating terms and everybody else is just there to sort of uh, sign off on whatever the promoter does so those are the three layers in effect what we want to achieve out of this framework is two outcomes one continuity which means it shouldn't be that one great ceo had a great era at a particular company and uh, there is uncertainty that if this ceo goes away then uh, what will the next successor do we don't know right so there should not be any uncertainty around con- continuity second is scalability right succession planning uh, these three decentralized ways of running a firm that we that we explain they help a business scale they help a business evolve they help a business continuously disrupt itself and nurture the competitive advantages without that it becomes a little bit of an ad hoc exercise right get it i guess completely agree with you on this as well but if you were to just uh, say let's say put a weightage on the financial metrics versus the qualitative factors so would you say that it's equally important that the qualitative aspects which you just mentioned they are also at par with the financial metrics which you compute while analyzing the capital allocation and the three metrics which you have used certainly yes uh, it just so happens that uh, every investor can choose a slightly different philosophy in certain philosophies you might uh, deemphasize the risk of succession a little bit for certain reasons the reasons could be that you are picking up a bunch of companies where these companies might be only 5 years into their existence you can't expect institutionalized frameworks to exist for those so you you might deemphasize a few factors here or there but otherwise broadly speaking yes it is as important as uh, picking up uh, clean accounts and picking up great capital allocation right get it get it so you know like just talking about the uh, recent valuations and the recent ipos which are coming up so sort of you know like there are a lot of companies which are launching their ipos all these fintechs which are there so many unicorns have been created in the year 2021 
so uh, like your framework suggests that you should at least analyze the past 10 years of data see the revenue growth see the uh, whether the roc is greater than the cost of capital so you then understand whether it is a cash flow generating firm or not and whether it is consistent compounder or not so in these ipos which are coming what would be your take or what would be your approach in terms of investing in these ipos because these are like quite recent and they're like data for the last 10 years it'll be th- that'll be a challenge of getting that data so what would be your advice on this so so we you know historically we made money from investing in ipo so dr lal uh, uh, we invested i think actually we invested in dr lal within a year of ipo right within a year That's of right. ipo and it's gone on to become one of our uh, most successful investments um amongst uh, tech companies that are listed in poh clearly is a great franchise cash generating machine run by a superb management team which has built it over 25 years of hard work so so like in all sectors like in all eras there'll be you know one or two good companies to emerge from this era as well right remember as i said at, right at that we began the conversation in the whole country there's barely dozen and a half stocks which will actually make money right and and those dozen and a half stocks one or two come along every decade so the bulk of the ipos whether they are consumer tech or non consumer tech normal normal ipos uh, bulk of the ipos will be a waste of time right uh, and the fa- further and faster you can run away from them the better it will be for you there will be one or two gems and the way to assess which of those are gems are are the technique techniques laid out by marcelis in our webinars and in diamonds right. in the dust which is first off look for credible accounting right doesn't matter whether it's an ip or not whether it's a tech company or not chore chore promoters will be perpetually out there looking to steal your money so use forensic accounting uh, uh, especially for the chartered accountants out there this is your forte it's a hugely powerful skill in india so ipo you are listed and already listed company use forensic accounting read the drhp with an accounting lens second is look for companies that have proven that they can generate free cash flow the definition of a business model is how you generate free cash flow if you don't have free cash flow you don't have a business model if you don't have a business why on earth are we even discussing investing so look for companies which generate free cash flow which means return on capital consistently above cost of capital right that's the second filter to apply and the third filter to apply is try to understand what gives the company pricing power what gives the company competitive advantages why can't somebody else come and take their profits away right is the other barriers to entry around uh, a smart use of data and technology say like an asian paints or are the barriers to entry around intellectual property like a divi's lab or are the barriers to entry around the sorts of network effect that sanjeev bichandani and nokri.com have built right so that's the third layer that's how business analysis is done uh, that's how it's done in sweden norway africa and india that's how it was done 20 years ago that's how it'll be done long after we are gone from this planet that's how it's done right. on listed entities that's how it's done on ipos there is nothing new under the sun for us to say that kuch naya ho raha hai kuch naya karte hain right and that's why batsmen like rahul dravid are all time legends right their style of batting endures it endured in don bradman's era it endures today and long after we are gone dravid type the dravids of the world will be remembered as utter legends who redefined indian cricket correct correct wonderful wonderful so i think i'll ask a last question from my side and then we'll take the questions from the audience so you also mentioned in your book diamonds in the dust that conglomerate that like you've given an example that conglomerates who are not focusing on their core businesses their roc is comparatively mm-hmm. lesser as compared to the other businesses who are just focused on their core business so i saw that you had mentioned about some uh, companies like mahindra and mahindra lnt which had le- lesser rocs as compared to asian paints or pd light tatas so you have titan and you have tcs satisfy all the criteria which are there that allows them to be in your portfolio but other companies of tatas itself it won't be possible for you to allocate them in your portfolio because of some of the other factors they don't cross the entire checklist so what is it that is going wrong with the same conglomerate so as you rightly said so within said if you look at tata sons itself uh, uh tcs and titan are super franchises right great capital allocation so so uh, you know super strong competitive advantages tcs around uh, recruitment and training uh, titan around the brand uh, 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 the cost of capital that with which it supports the market its business model um, but within the same conglomerate you have tata steel tata steel generates as much free cash flow in 10 years as tcs does i think in 6 or 9 months right um, and remember tata steel has huge 
comparative advantages theoretically speaking around getting free coal and free ore in spite of that they can't actually generate free cash flow because capital allocation went or i uh, 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 over the past few decades right now now if you step back and think about it right the indian conglomerate is fundamentally a creation of the socialist era in the socialist era uh, 360s 70s if you made high roc in india the government would call you up and say boss tumko nationalize kar rahe hain so it would be a bonkers idea it would be crazy crazy in the 60s 70s 80s to generate high roc so what did those smart promoters conglomerate leaders of the 60s 70s 80s did they said let me not build high roc let me take the roc and spread it across lots of businesses har ek business ka roc will be relatively low so that i don't attract the government's attention and i'll do a whole bunch of things and spread myself uh, across several sectors this also worked in that era because co- capital was very scarce so in the 60s 70s 80s we were amongst the world's poorest country 60s mein to regularly famine hota tha so capital was super scarce and therefore a conglomerate which made money in say one area steel mein bana liya they funded 20 other things right the birlas the tatas the mahindra and mahindra uh, these sorts of conglomerates flourished in that era you were basically a capital you're allocating capital to lots of businesses in a capital scarce country you were keeping roc deliberately at low levels so to avoid attraction from powerful politicians and thirdly you know in the socialist era license raj ka era by definition you need access to the polity for the licenses nahi to license kahan se aayega right now that world is pretty much gone right capital is no longer scarce uh, you can borrow from hdfc bank or you can raise venture capital you can raise private equity and as we were discussing 5 minutes back you can come to the stock market the 10 year bond deal in india which 15 years ago used to be 16 17% today is 6% right so you know if capital is is available uh, uh high roc is no longer a sin the government is not going to call up a company just because roc 40% hai high roc is allowed capital is available uh, it's a large free market economy and therefore a completely different business model is able to dominate this paradigm and those companies sit the companies that dominate india's profitability paradigm today sit in our consistent compounders portfolio and these companies will carry on flourishing and gradually the conglomerate will fade away right as you rightly uh, alluded to some of the companies in the conglomerate world tcs titan will uh, go on to become self standing uh, 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 giants highly successful companies tcs already the giant uh, we reckon titan also will become a giant over the next decade uh, uh, their their relevance as profitable cash generative entities will be not because of the conglomerate it will be because of their uh, their uh, own competitive advantages and the conglomerate is a way of functioning will gradually uh, die away uh, uh, we are very much in the in in the era where pure play pure play focused high ca- high quality capital allocators are going to dominate india over the next 10 20 years so would you also be against the concept of diversification by uh, inorganic ac- expansion so if a company wants to acquire other company so would you so be the world that? over there are some, there are a handful of ceos slash promoters who know how to allocate capital whether it's in america or in india i think it's fair to say we can count on the fingers of two hands indian promoters and ceos who are good at capital allocation when it comes to m and a right say example would be say uday kotak saab or say adipak parekh ji right the handful of promoters there probably no more than 10 promoters in india know how to allocate capital to mna um, and again we back to the, the rahul dravid analogy right in any in any profession there will be a handful of peak performers baki sab chunnu munnu ghum rahe honge handful of peak performers whether it's in cricket whether it's in capital allocation our job as fund managers is to look for that handful of peak performers choti ke khiladi right the bradmans of capital allocation which in the context of say indian corporate life would be adipak parekh uh, and uday kotak uh, um, the asian paints uh, promoters the asian paints management teams uh, say kuldeep singh dhira ji at burger paints right high quality extremely astute capital allocators um, william thorndike has written a great book called the outsiders about america's great capital allocators right he studied a 40 year period he found only six companies that were outstanding at capital allocation and, and such is the nature of any any competitive profession whether it's business whether it's sport uh, and you and i exist to learn from these outstanding capital allocators to sharpen our skill sets but most promoters the world over uh, don't generate value from mna they get uh, uh, foxed into doing it by clever investment bankers 
and in many cases they end up ruining their business empires india is littered with stories of business people businessmen promoters who destroyed their business empires through misguided mna pehle bhi hua hai aage bhi hoga that's what makes business life interesting correct 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 wonderful answer so let's take a few questions from the audience so the first question is from tushar khandelwal he's asking most companies in your consistent compounded portfolio derive their competitive advantage from their distribution mode with the point of purchase shifting from shop door to mobile screen that is the d2c businesses would this advantage still remain akshay do, do you want to take that that most companies in uh, in our portfolio yeah. is based on a distribution mode sure so uh, look uh, uh, let me let me uh, take a step back first the the common thing uh, around competitive advantage of our portfolio companies is that they have built their competitive advantage in the most difficult aspects of their industry right uh, in some cases i would say as you're saying in in many cases uh, this difficulty lies with distribution uh, in india distribution is challenging in india uh, you've got uh, you've got weak infrastructure you've got too many diverse geographies on top of it uh, uh, tastes and preferences differ Uh, the depth of consumption is not enough for you to to sort of uh, sit at one place and distribute in a hundred kilometer radius. There will be pockets of consumption and wide gaps, uh, geographically speaking, between these pockets. These are the reasons why distribution is one of the challenging aspects, not the only challenging aspect. Uh, some of our companies, that's right, uh, they have uh, found a found a way to overcome this. Now. when it comes to uh, say new ways of doing distribution whether it be e-commerce or something else um, what is incumbent upon being a great company is that you need to constantly figure out uh, ways of uh, uh, sort of uh, finding the difficult aspect of the industry again and then uh, uh, managing it in a way that can't be replicated if e-commerce has solved the difficulty then either you be the one who solved it via e-commerce in a way that nobody else can or you abandon that competitive edge and focus on some other area of competitive edge in the same industry if you don't do that then yes you are right uh, the the evolution in the external environment will eventually become disruptive for that company to take a very quick example say for instance asian paints which is actually i would say the biggest distribution oriented mode right voluminous product no channel partners involved thin margin for the channel combine the three and inventory turns becomes the becomes the most challenging thing in the paint industry which is what asian paints has solved now tomorrow uh, whether it be an amazon or somebody else uh, they can maybe overcome this through technology to something else what has asian paints done uh last uh, decade or so in, in fact more than a decade they've been uh, uh, they've been investing in changing the way market share will be defined in the paint industry not focusing on inventory turns only in fact on the other hand totally tilting the business towards labor oriented value adds right so they've offered uh, asian paint home solutions color consultancies uh more recently the sanitization as a service home decor as a service they're disintermediating uh, the the whole architect concept by actually upgrading their influencer community into becoming architects um and in a way they are saying that look uh, five years down the line it won't be the inventory turns which will define competitive edge it will actually be labor oriented value adds that a business provides if i can be the first one and the best one to provide that then i as asian paints will be able to continue uh, 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 generating competitive advantages out of my business right get it uh, the next question is by uday patak he is asking like uh, in india if the investment in exchange traded funds which are there they are like highly underrated as compared to other mutual funds so in order to diversify our portfolio what would you recommend like the investment in exchange traded funds what are your views on that i mean you can go and do it but you doing it in a country as we've discussed right half the stock half the company's books are cooked of the remaining half most of the promoters don't know how to allocate capital so if you are investing in an etf unless it's an extraordinarily well built etf 80% of the money you're putting in won't even 80% the companies won't even deliver, deliver compounding above your cost to capital so 
you might as well open the window and throw your money out of the window i mean i don't understand why somebody that, that sort of concept has relevance in the western world because in the western world you have a degree of market efficiency in our country the where the benchmark lags nominal gdp growth the indian benchmarks the headline benchmarks mm-hmm. in india lag nominal gdp growth because of a combination of accounting fraud and poor capital allocation why would you want to go and put your hard earned money in etfs now if you are you know if you're a very small ticket investor and you've got a day job which means you can't really afford to a do stock picking yourself and b you can't really afford to hire a good fund manager as a hota hai there are millions of people in india who are working hard in offices in factories in difficult jobs they're earning modest sums of money for them this sort of etf idea index funds can make sense because the savings are not so large that they can afford to hire people like us at the same time they don't have the time to read diamonds in the dust and invest themselves for so for them index funds is a good idea but for other people if they have the means to either do analysis themselves and train themselves through the chartered accountancy profession through reading books like ours then i would urge them to do that this huge opportunity in india for for intelligent people who are willing to train themselves in investing or if you don't want to train yourself but you've got uh, a decent corpus of money then hire a fund manager and get get him or her to invest for you don't uh, don't try to do etfs etf should be done if you have no other option in life right get it next question is by renuka nayadish she is asking what is the right age to start investing so what would you recommend if a person is just in his 15 16 or 20 well, uh, is there a right age to start investing i'm asking because you're a ca and you guys start very early in life right i think around the time we, we start wearing trousers you guys start doing the ca qualification <laughs> Uh, no i started early and i made a lot of mistakes uh, so so uh, in a way i'm thankful for that but uh, but you know like like uh, we've discussed earlier also in this uh, conversation is that it takes a fair bit of time for you to become a serious uh, investor because it takes one is technical training to figure out uh, how to analyze companies how to analyze businesses so there's a fair bit of accounting corporate strategy uh, uh, you know governance checks and all of that so it takes time to uh, to build that but there is no stopping you know if you have some pocket money to uh, to really uh, uh, experiment then uh, uh, there's there's nothing really that stops you today you can buy a single share right through a demat account uh, but our suggestion would be that you first uh, do the technical uh, training at least right to you you know the basics you know how to apply those basics so which will allow you to make an intelligent uh, or an informed investing decision otherwise what you do will be uh, you're testing your luck or it's a punt by going and investing in just about uh, any random company uh, or any company that you don't understand fully well because uh, again going back to what rakshit was saying if the stock falls uh, you will be figuring out what to do so it's better to do the research before you invest rather than do the research after you invest which is what most of young investors uh, end up doing so right. do the technical training uh and then try and do your uh, do your favorite of small investing right. and graduate up so say that what is you started investing by may ask uh i guess about 18 not uh, okay. from the measly stipend yeah. i used to get uh mm-hmm. but like i said i got lucky a few times and then i thought i was a very skilled investor easy what is mere khayal se wo 14 se hi kar raha tha sir yeah so i'll take the last last two questions so these are not related to finance as such one and asked by anas kureshi is asking what are your learnings during the covid 19 pandemic which have really helped you in order to you know like change uh, over the last one and a half two years i think sarel i think it's worth your highlighting that the big learning for all of us uh, through through the last 19 months as we saw people panic and then get euro- euphoric all in the space of 19 months uh so kushal you know the, uh, on one on one hand things were obviously uh, not great right a uh, uh, lot of us uh, you know, including i'm sure within your circles also you had people either uh, getting sick or unfortunately even losing their lives uh, so one was that you know is obviously that uh, 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 there was a serious side to it which which made us all appreciate uh, what we have by right? just uh, being healthy through the 19, 19 months has been in a way uh, a blessing uh, for us i think the learning has been that uh, we use this time to actually write the book so uh, putting together our thoughts on what all uh, the whole team at marsalus the whole research team at marsalus how to think 
uh, to put that into a structured manner and and uh, bring it out as a book uh, has been a fantastic learning because that helps us clarify a lot of our own uh, thoughts also before we put it out to 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 people uh, right. and uh, and while we're doing this in you know, we're obviously building marcellus as a business also uh, so again great learnings there from uh, you know why people would still invest with you and things around you are so bad so that tells us what communication is important if you are uh, giving people the right uh, or communicating the right philosophy you know, they know that uh, what's a good time to invest what's not a uh, good time to invest uh, right. and final learning is uh, you know which everybody has seen is that uh, and i think that that's a key takeaway for any investor is that it's impossible to time the market right? Right. when you thought that the lockdown was announced the economy is now shut down and desh barbad hai right that is the day the market bottom so Correct. i think the key learning for you is to not try to time or second guess what the market is going to do kahan jayega kya hoga all of that right uh, focusing on on selecting great companies and uh, i think that is learning which has really been in, reinforced with all of us although right. we always believed in it yeah and the last question from my side who amongst the three of you play the best when it comes to cricket I'm I, I'm no good anymore. I can barely barely run. So I think yeah, I'm ruled out between Rakshit and Salil now. I think in the relative way, Saurabh must might still be there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much, the three of you, like for your time. In fact, it was indeed a very very interesting discussion. And thanks a lot for guiding the entire audience, all the millennials and all the young investors who are watching this video. They'll understand the power of long term investing and the power of compounding. So thank you so much for putting it in a very easy way. Thank you, Kushal. Thanks for listening. Thanks. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you.